But, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited that we're here in week five of this series and uh, what God through Daniel has to teach for us, uh, teach us today. I do want to make a, just a special announcement again next week is Reformation Sunday, two services, same times, 8 and 1030. But you know, Reformation is a day in the church year where we get to celebrate God's grace. We do that each and every week, yes, but uh, it's a special day where we get to see how God raised up a man by the name of Martin Luther to help correct some teachings that were in the church, and um, it'll be a, a great week next week as well, so be sure to come back. This week, uh, we are, again, concluding what we've been in this series, uh, Daniel More Than Lions, and again, I hope it's been beneficial for you just to, to hear these stories out of Daniel, but more so to get the context around them and see where Daniel was living, how he was living his life, and then the, the lessons that we can take from that as well, and what I'm doing today is, you know, Daniel has 12 chapters, and we've been through six of them. I am condensing the last six chapters into one message today, so I appreciate your prayers today as well. Uh, we could really probably go another six weeks in every chapter, looking at every prophecy that's in here. But for our purposes today, I want to tie up the series with a bow uh, through the message that God gives Daniel and what he wants us to know about what's to come, and that is the end. You know, everyone likes a good story. It doesn't matter if you uh, pick up a book, or you read an article online or in a magazine, uh, you hear it on the news, watch it on Netflix, or go see it in the theater. All good stories, they have a gripping storyline, and hopefully a happy ending too, right? Every story, though, has an end. It may be happy, it may produce tears, but every story has an ending. You know, I'm not one that reads for pleasure too often. That is unless I know the ending of the book. I like knowing the ending before I even start, so maybe that's why I'm a pastor. I don't know. But uh, I like this ending that we have for us today. But I, I'll even ask friends, you know, about good books that they've read, and I'll let them tell me the ending, and then I'll go read the book. Does anyone else like that? Is that just me? Okay, I see a couple hands. First service, they looked at me like I was crazy. So I'm glad to know I'm not alone. In our text today, through the prophet Daniel, God reveals to us what happens at the end. And as we prepare our hearts to, to live uh, and go through the end of the year celebrations coming up, I mean, it really is just around the corner, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve, just a couple months away, all things winding down uh, to the end of the year. God allows us to not only know the end of the biblical story through Daniel, but also to know our end as well. You see, the book of Daniel is a relatively unknown book of the Bible, apart from a few stories that some people know. Daniel, he wrote it during the time of the exile when Israel and Judah, uh, as nations, were taken from their homelands and put into captivity in a foreign country named Babylon, which we've heard about, known for its wealth, its opulence, its uh, plethora of gods the sexual immorality that was there, and some crazy kings that we've also read about. But the first six chapters of the book of Daniel tells the history of the people of God as they were taken to live in Babylon. We heard about how De or King Nebuchadnezzar uh, took Daniel and his three friends, and he made Daniel an advisor to him by interpreting his dreams. That's how we first hear of Daniel in, in this book. But you may remember last week how Daniel, he was thrown into a den of lions because he dared pray to the one true God. Maybe you remember a couple weeks back when we looked at Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown into a blazing furnace and how God was with them and protected them uh, no matter what they went through, the fire and the flames. See, these events and more that take place in the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. The last six chapters are prophecies which deal with things to come. And in our text today, chapter 12 is the last chapter of this book. And Daniel, he foretells what will happen at the end. That is the end of time. So can you imagine what a blessing and good news that this passage that we're going to be reading from today was to the people who heard it in Daniel's day, right? I kind of put myself in their shoes. We all know what it feels like, I think, to have a yearning for home, to want to go home. Maybe you've been on vacation for a little bit, and you finally get to come home, and you're looking forward to it, get in your own bed, be around your stuff. You know, you get excited as you see the signs approaching. 
that you're coming home. I know every time that I travel outside the state of Texas, when I come back and I see that state line of Texas, I always put on the same song in the car by Little Texas called God Bless Texas, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if my family likes me for that or not, but I like that song. And it, it just lets me know I'm back in the great state of Texas. But what's even better when you're traveling is when you start to see the, the city, your destination on the sign, Austin, 104 miles, right? And then with every passing sign, that number it dwindles until you're getting closer and closer. And finally, you take the, the ramp off of I-35 that says Austin, and you're even that much closer to home. And then as you get closer to Cedar Park and Round Rock or wherever you may live, you see that sign and you get excited, right? You're finally home. I think uh, what Dorothy said, she was on to something, right? There's no place like home. I think that's, that's true. You know, for the most part of the, the first six chapters, the people of Daniel's day, they were not at home. And they had no hope of going home for the foreseeable future. They were captured and taken to Babylon, which is a place that was far away from home. The prophet Jeremiah had told the people that when they arrived in Babylon, not to expect to go home, but to take up residence there. So let's look in Jeremiah 29, uh, verse 4, where he's talking about this. It says this, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And then we get down to Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11, a very well-known verse of the Bible, where it says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. And then in verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't that awesome to know the context behind that, that verse now after studying this over the, pe the past five weeks? Um, for me, it just it reinforces how God is in control and uh, his plan is to give us a hope and a future. See, God told the people that they weren't going home because of their sin. But after the time appointed, a time completed in Babylon, they would return to their home. And through it, all, the, all they needed to do was not worry but trust in God's plan. And how he would work it to give them that hope in a future. I think you and I, we are in a very much a similar situation. As Christians, there's a longing to be with the Lord and to go where uh, those who have died in the Lord are, right? Those who have had faith in Jesus. The problem is left to ourselves, our sinfulness, it separates us from God and even from one another. We want to be part of one big happy family, right? But there's division and there's strife and there's anger and there's dissension and there's spite. And I think it shows up in our relationships with each other. You know, that, that sin, that original sin that was passed down to us, we possess by nature. We see that in the book of Psalm where it tells us that surely we're uh, born in sin, we're conceived in sin. And then you take that and you add it with all the acts that we commit, all those sinful acts that we commit that are not pleasing to God, that separates us from God. And we long to be part of an existence where there is no more sin, where there's no more sorrow or hatred or tears or even death. But we're not there yet. Not yet. But God wants us, I think, to experience just little slices, little glimpses of what heaven's going to be like here in his church on earth. It's why we pray for one another. It's why we walk with one another in this life. We share our struggles, and we always uh, take the time to point each other back to the greatest sign of God's love, which is the cross for us. God, he comes to us, and he wants us to keep our eyes onto him. That's why we gather and we celebrate the gifts of God, that he comes near to us, as we see in baptism, where he creates that faith, and we receive the forgiveness of sins and holy communion, actually partaking in the body and blood of Christ. But, you know, when we look at the world around, around us and the sinfulness that abounds, can't you feel lost sometimes? When you look at everything that's on the news, you're like, God, where are you? You just feel a little bit lost. I can't tell you how many times I've thought over the past couple of years that our world in which we, li we live, it's changed, and not always for uh, a good way, right? Not always for the better. 
I know many of you felt that way as well because you've come and you've talked with me and you've said very similar things that we're not living in times like we're in the past. The values that we hold as a nation, or at least that we held as a nation in the past, now they're mocked, aren't they? A lot of them at least. We're called old-fashioned or out of touch with reality because we believe that the Bible is the supreme authority of truth which we touch everything else against. Or just the fact that we believe in God. That is openly mocked in our world today. We live here, but it's like we don't belong here. Things have really changed, and again, not always for the better. See, this is how the people of Daniel's time felt as well. They longed to go back home, but couldn't. So God, through the prophet Daniel, he spoke of another time to come when God would put the pieces of their broken lives back together. And what God said to Daniel, it still applies to us today. For God in heaven has seen the sinfulness and the brokenness that is evident in our world today and in our lives. And God in his rich mercy has sent his help, the person, his one and only son, our Lord and Savior, to save us from sin, death, and the devil. You see, Christ came down from heaven to be truly part of this human existence. Fully man, fully God. He lived on earth to experience our brokenness. He, he knows what it means to suffer, yet without sinning. And yet he was humble enough, as Paul says, to go to a cross and to die a death that we all deserve. Jesus, he does this in your place and mine. And then the prophet Isaiah, he, he picks up on this sacrifice for us in Isaiah 53, where he, he says, Surely he, meaning Jesus, took up our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, that's for me, that, that passage is so joyful because it tells us that someone paid our price, but it's also a gut punch, isn't it? Hearing what Jesus endured for us. But it shows you the immense love that your Savior has for you. Jesus not only stands up for God's people, but Jesus, he stands in for each and every one of you. Standing in your place, absorbing your punishment, dying your death. And the good news of Daniel and of Christ's victory over death in the grave is that Jesus rose again in the body to life everlasting. So let's listen to, to Daniel chapter 12, uh, just the first three verses here uh, of what it says. It says, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There will come a time, and it will be at the end of time. When all the dead shall be raised, and those who believe in Jesus will rise in their new and glorious bodies, free from sin and decay, to live with the Lord, being at home with him in his glory forever and ever, never to face sin, never to taste death again. It'll be just as the Apostle Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 15. That chapter is known as the resurrection chapter in the Bible. And he starts off by saying this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as, all, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands his, the kingdom to the, God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Paul, he's talking about here how we've been created like Adam. We heard about that, how we possess that sin from our birth. But we've been recreated also to be just like Jesus. And how is that? In baptism, through faith. In baptism, the Holy Spirit, he's washed away your sins and he's given you a new life in Christ. If anyone has been baptized in Christ, it says that person is a new creation. You've been made a new creation so that you can be part of that new creation when Christ comes again at his second coming. 
And when he comes, the Bible says that we'll all be changed. And it's a mystery that we can't fathom what will happen on that last day because it's unlike anything that we've ever experienced or will experience. But we can know the ending and how amazing it will be. Look again at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall all be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come the the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see this victory that Daniel speaks of today and that Paul mentions here. It's also the scene that, that John, he writes about in Revelation 7. And I, I just want to go over this, this text real quick. Listen to this scene. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Echoing the holiness of God for all time. That's something that we get to look forward to as well. This is what the end looks like for you and for me and for all believers in Christ where we'll be forever with the Lord. So how then should we live our lives waiting for this glorious ending? Again, let's go back to what Paul, what he finishes that, that uh, section of scripture with in verse 58. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What's that mean to you? That your labor is not in vain. For me, Keep it simple. It means faith works, right? That the faith that you have in Jesus, it works for your salvation, but the labor that of telling people the good news as well, that it works for their salvation, and it's not in vain. That God, he's going to use you no matter what situation you find yourself in. No matter if you're in the fire or the flame or in a den of lions, right? God, he wants to use you. But we talk about the end of time. I don't know what kind of feelings that that stirs up in you, right? Because the Bible, it's very clear about signs. As we look at road signs on our way home, and that gives us comfort, God, in the same way, he gives us signs to give us comfort that the second coming, we don't know when it's coming, but it, we see the signs again. In the Bible, it says there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Is that happening? Yeah. There'll be earthquakes, famines, all happening, right? So are we living in the end time? Absolutely we are. But hear me when I say this. We've been living in the end time since the time of the cross. <laughs> Ever since Jesus died, we've been living in the end times. All those things have been happening. And I think God did that for a very specific reason. You go and you read the book of Acts, you, you see how the church exploded onto the scene, right? They were living their lives for God, doing whatever God called them to do. There was nothing that they wouldn't do. They believed Christ was coming back in their lifetime. Those disciples, those apostles who've seen the risen Lord thought that the Lord was coming back. The same is true for us. We don't know if it's today. We don't know if it's a week from now, a hundred years from now. Whenever the Lord decides, it'll be okay. Why? Because he's given us that faith. But he wants that faith that he's given us for us to go and to share it so that others can have the same hope. He doesn't want us to have fear about the end times. He doesn't want us to let the world... Um, mess with our minds in that way. There are so many things that you get on social media these days. There, I, I see plenty <laughs> every week. New ones that are popping up on TikTok, on, on Facebook. People predicting the end, right? And it's important that we know that about what our, our kids are, are looking at there on social media as well. But they're all dr driven to cause fear in people's heart to gain followers. Jesus, he gives us the signs that we need to know. And the greatest sign that he's given us is right there. It's the cross. 
to know that God, that he loves us. There's a lot of craziness out there. A lot of distractions that are trying to take our eyes off of God, our Savior, Jesus. Believers, again today, they're routinely, openly mocked. Not so different from the world that Daniel lived in. You see, the point of this entire series and the point of the very text today is to say, keep it simple. There's one God. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross and he rose from the grave for you. Keep your eyes up there. It's the only sign you need in this life. Many will claim to have the knowledge and tell you when the end will be, that they can interpret the signs. Many have tried and all have failed. God tells us we don't know the day or the hour. And that's why he wants us to keep our eyes on the only sign that saves, and that's Jesus. There's no other sign that says it like the cross, that you're loved, that you're forgiven, that you can start over. It's a sign that promises you life after this. It's a sign that says God thinks that you're worth it. God thinks you're worth it. Say that with me. God thinks I'm worth it. One more time. God thinks I'm worth it. He's proven it, and he loves you, and he forgives you. The book of Daniel, along with all the Bible, it helps us to know that God is sovereign, that he's in control of all things. No matter how bad things seem, God, he's still in charge, and he wins in the end. We get the benefit of knowing how the story ends. When we know that, when we know that nothing happens apart from God, that he's working all things together for good, we can live with hope, a hope that this world has never seen, right? A hope of being the church. And it's in knowing this that it helps us persevere and trust him no matter what troubled times lay ahead. You see, Daniel discipled at least two or three kings that we know of, we've heard about in this story. He discipled an entire pagan nation, an entire world to this day, as they read this book and they learn Billions of people from all time just by reading God's word. If God discipled that many people through just one Daniel, imagine what he can do and what he wants to do through each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray.